Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, my talk today is on non-compliant and counterfeit cable, uh, one of the problems that we've seen in the industry. And I am speaking today on behalf of the Communication Cable and Connectivity Association, as Michael mentioned. If you're not familiar with who the CCCA is, we are a nonprofit organization, uh, actually an association addressing things like quality and performance, but more importantly, safety, environmental uh, impact, and other key issues in our marketplace and what we see in our industry today. And our members include a lot of the companies that you see, well, all the companies you see, their logos here, but it's the main cable and connectivity, both copper and optical fiber, uh, manufacturers, our raw material suppliers, and our, and our distributors in our industry today. So we get together and we look at the state of our industry. We try to make sure that the things that are going on in our industry are well known. And our real goal is to make sure that all of the communication cabling products that are installed in the North American market uh, comply with U.S. and Canadian codes and standards as far as electrical performance, but also life safety performance. And our mission is education. We do a lot of education, like these kinds of seminars and some other, th other areas. We have a website and those kinds of things, which I'll touch on later in the presentation. So our industry is very much governed by codes and standards. You're all familiar, most likely, with the National Electrical Code or the NFPA 70 code that is currently in the 2017 revision in the United States and the Canadian Electrical Code has similarly gone through some recent revisions and they're very similar in terms of what they require. But these codes are very life safety focused. The reason for these codes is to ensure that products are installed in a manner that they are being used in a safe way. They're installed in, in the areas for which they're designed to be installed. So they are very much a focus of the mandatory uh, code inspection process that goes along with these codes and they're enforceable by law. Our industry also has a lot of standards that we associate our, progress, pro our products and services with. The Telecommunications Industry Association has these standards. Believe it or not, they're all voluntary, but if we didn't all voluntarily make products that comply with those, then nothing would talk to one another, nothing would work. So. The transmission performance is the primary focus of the TAIA and EIA standards. There's terminology, too, that's used in association with these codes and standards. On the code side, the term listed is a very important term, and we're going to explore that a little bit more in a minute. And that's the, that's the terminology that you'll most associate with a, a code. The term verified, or in some cases tested, is what we associate with transmission performance. So you'll see the term verified or tested as something that is basically confirming what a manufacturer states about their own product. It's generally associated with a third party independent test organization. Both of them actually are, but on the TIA side it's really referred to as verified or tested. Specifically in the National Electrical Code, the latest revision, Article 800.179, talks about communication wire and cables needing to be listed in accordance with the, the code itself and marked in accordance with that code. So we're going to talk more about what those marks look like, what they should be, uh, what they should be uh, marked using, but I'd like to draw your attention also to that last sentence in red in this little paragraph which talks about conductors in communications cables, other than coaxial cables, and other than optical fiber cables, shall be copper. And we're going to visit that later in the presentation, but it's an important thing to remember. Now, the National Electrical Code for our industry, specifically communication, has different ratings for different installation environments, specifically the ones that we're most familiar with, CMP, or communications plenum, CMR, communications riser, and in some cases CM for things like patch cords. Those designations are the ones that we use to identify where that product can be installed in a building in a safe manner. And that's how the National Electrical Code will designate where those products can be installed. The listing term that I just used is a safety listing. And 
the National Electrical Code basically says that you have to be part of a list that's been generated by a nationally recognized testing laboratory. The two most common in our industry would be U Underwriters Laboratories or Intertech or ETL. Those are the two organizations that will have the product submitted to them by the manufacturer. They'll be tested in accordance with industry standards and then they'll be approved for use in certain environments and that approval will be uh, will appear on a list that these organizations make public. So if an authority having jurisdiction like a code inspector wants to verify that a product actually has the listing that it, it says it has, they can go to one of these organizations and they can verify that. So the AHJ or authority having jurisdiction has to be able to verify that the different c products by the different manufacturers are appearing on a legitimate list by one of these nationally recognized labs. The reality, however, is that people want a bargain today. People want to reduce their cost in whatever manner they seem they see fit. So there are unscrupulous manufacturers out there that are looking to cut corners, reduce your cost, but doing so at the cost of the possibility of making something that's code compliant. In fact, making code and standard compliant product is expensive. It's an expensive proposition to make something that works according to the standard and the code. Unfortunately, it's relatively easy to fake that compliance. And I'll talk about how that happens in the next few slides. And not everyone knows how to tell whether a product truly is listed as according to what the manufacturer has put on the cable jacket, for example. The CCCA has decided that we need to, as part of our mandate, do some market surveillance programs. And these are just four of the surveillance programs that we've undertaken in the last several years. Certainly the, the communication data or LAN cables that I'm going to be talking about today. We're also looking at copper patch cords and how they perform even down to the specification of the physical dimensions of the plugs, which can be very, very important to their overall performance. We're looking at optical fiber jumpers and optical fiber assemblies to ensure that the mechanical characteristics and the optical characteristics that they claim to have are really what they have. And we've started to publish this information on our website. What we found, however, is sometimes disturbing and sometimes even alarming. We found product that the packaging or the cable itself is showing what we call unauthorized or in some cases counterfeit listing agency certification marks. Now you remember the National Electrical Code says that if you get your product listed you have to mark it according to what that listing is. So the way that manufacturers do that on their products, especially on copper communication cable, is you put something in the cable legend. I can pick up a piece of cable, I can look at the cable legend, and it says something like UL or CUL on it, and then it gives you a designation for CMP, CMR, CMX, whatever it is. And those designations are defined by the National Electrical Code, okay? But there are companies manufacturing product that are putting these unauthorized marks on their cable even though they've never submitted the product to be tested. So they're putting a UL or an ETL on their cable jacket and they've never actually submitted, submitted it for a burn test. So you can consider that product counterfeit, whether it has a counterfeit brand name on it or not is another question, but you can consider that the mark that it's using to designate its listing is counterfeit. It may or may not be code compliant, in some cases, I would say, and we'll, we'll demonstrate that in many cases, it is not code compliant. There are times when a manufacturer will be code compliant. They'll submit a product, they'll have a listing, but they'll let that lapse. Part of the verification process and the listing process that both of the nationally recognized testing labs use is a follow-up program. You pay on a yearly basis, and those organizations come to your facility, they take product, and they retest it on a regular basis. In this way, we're making sure that the product continues to be safe and you haven't altered any of your materials or anything to somehow jeopardize the listing that you have, have achieved. In some cases, companies choose to stop using a listing agency, so they stop paying their bill, and they're removed from their listing agency's list, but they continue to print on the cable jacket, unfortunately. 
How do you tell if it's a counterfeit mark? Well, if it's underwriters laboratories, there's a good way to be able to tell that if you have access to the packaging itself. Anyone that uses underwriters laboratories as their listing agency is required to use one of these holographic labels on the packaging, whether it's the box or the reel, or what have you. That holographic label, which is supplied by UL, is affixed to that box. And they change it from time to time to ensure that it's not copied. But you get that directly from UL when you use them as your listing agency. So if there is no label, and yet the product says it's UL listed on the jacket, you can assume that it's a probably a counterfeit product or may not be compliant to the NEC. A lot of times they're deceptively advertised. You'll see terminology that I would say is very unofficial terminology that I've shown here. Plenum rated, plenum cable, plenum approved. Sometimes it's in the marketing literature, sometimes it's on their website, what have you, but those, those terms don't mean anything. It's the CMP or CMR that's listed on the cable jacket that really has the meaning there. Another problem that we've seen, unfortunately, is that there's packaging and or cable that shows a UL or ETL mark, and in the case of UL, actually has a holographic label affixed to the box, but actually doesn't meet the code that's, that it says it meets. That product is definitely non-compliant, and I'm gonna talk about what we've found and how to tell, but it's not manufactured generally from products that are needed to pass flame and smoke generation tests. The materials that are used are very specific to be able to pass these tests, and they tend to be expensive. So in order to reduce the cost of a manufacturer, they're trying to use the alternate materials. There are materials that can be used to change uh, or to achieve smoke generation and flame spread tests. Unfortunately, those, those materials sometimes also affect transmission performance adversely, so there's a balance there. So you have to look at whether that product has significant fire performance testing or safety risks associated with it if you detect that. So how do you know if you, if you have a box of cable or a reel of cable, it says it's UL listed, it says it's, it's got the, that, uh, that mark or the uh, holographic label on it. Well, fortunately with underwriters laboratories, they go to great lengths to protect their marks and their listings. They do market surveillance, and the CCCA also assists in that. And if any one of us or UL identifies a product that appears to have a UL marking on it for a listing, then, and, and it's actually not been tested by UL, UL will actually purchase that material right off the open market, whether it's a distributor or a, a website. They'll bring it in, and they'll actually subject it to the industry standard NFPA 262 test. And then if it, if it fails, they'll put out a public notice right on their website. So this is an example of that. They warn of communication cable with unauthorized, or I would say counterfeit references to UL, and they tested it, and they say right in their website, this cable does not comply with the safety standard for US and Canada, and was not authorized to use the UL marks on the product. And you can see, Right in the cable legend, it says UL and CUL. So they're claiming to have been tested by UL. UL never had a record of this manufacturer. You can see on the cable jacket, it also says CMP or FT6. Again, claiming to be plenum rated, and clearly UL identified that they are not compliant with that, that, uh, that listing. So they'll take a picture of the box. In fact, there are 16 public notices today just on UL's website regarding public notices on non-compliant and counterfeit communication cable, just communication cable. So 16 different manufacturers, they'll show a photograph of the box, they'll show a photograph of the cable legend, they'll state what the issue is, whether they've tested it, whether it passes or not. They'll even tell you where the product can be purchased or has been purchased, if they can identify that. So UL does some due diligence in protecting their marks you can also get additional information from either listing agency. So if you visit the Intertech or UL websites, and I've shown the examples of both of those websites, there is a form that you can fill out. You can do as little as just type in the company name into the search field and hit enter. And when what comes up, it should be the name of the company, 
the different listings that that company has for the different types of cables. So if you have a communication cable and you type in that company name and that company comes up, it should say that it has communication cables listed as part of their listing. If you, get, if you type in a company name and you get no results, then you have a problem because clearly that organization has not used the listing agency that they claim to have used for their listings. There's another way that you can check that. Again, if it's a, a UL listed product, the CCCA created what's called the Cable Check app. It's an app that's available through the uh, Google Play and the Apple Store. Right now, the current version of the Apple app is not working because with the new iOS version, it started to become incompatible, so we have to get it updated. It will be updated shortly. But in this app, you are able to look at the E number. So if you are using Underwriters Laboratories as your listing agency, and uh, once you've completed that process, they will issue an E file number for the product, that, the type of product that you've been testing. And if you take that E file number that you see many times listed on the cable jacket and type that in, it should come up with the manufacturer name right in the app. And that's a way to tell in the field whether or not the product that you're looking at is actually listed by UL. Some additional clues to look for, poor cable design and or quality control. So with communication cable, especially twisted pair copper communication cable, the cable geometry is extremely important in the transmission performance. We put together these pairs and we put them inside the cable jacket and we put cross fillers in for the high performance products and those kinds of things to make sure that the pairs are oriented versus one another in a very specific way so that you have things like crosstalk control and those kinds of things. If you start to see product that has a lot of lumps in it, a lot of kinks in it, a lot of problems, even like a uh, corkscrew motion in the, on the outside of the cable jacket, you're going to see probably a lot of transmission performance failures when you go to use that product. The, some of that can be associated with the cable manufacturer and some of that can be associated with the actual packaging process. Twisted pair cable is affected by packaging processes and our industry in general, especially in North America, uses a company called Relax. Relax has a patented process that is very friendly to, to, to twisted pair cable. So the example of the box on the left, if you were to cut away that pl a cardboard around the, the wind, it's a figure eight wind and the product pays out from the center of that, you can see how uniform that wind is and how large that opening is for that payout. That's what's going to have the best performance once you pull that product out from that wind. It's going to not kink. It's going to not twist. Unfortunately, there are manufacturers out there that are not using the Relax process. They're not using the Cadillac of the industry, as I will call it. They're using other processes. And you can see that the result of their wind is very different. It's not as uniform. And that payout hole is very small, which can lead to kinking and tangling and those kinds of things. So while, while that may not necessarily mean it's a counterfeit cable, it's something to, be watch, to watch out for because it can really affect adversely the performance of your product. Some additional things to be uh, wary of, unfamiliar brands from unknown manufacturers. Now there's, there's a lot of manufacturers in the industry outside of the ones that are just here at Bixie. And there are some quality manufacturers that are manufacturing this kind of product that may be not be here at Bixie, but you may know their names. What I'm talking about is products that you've never heard of before, but boy, they are cheap. In fact, if you look at, they're only available from online vendors. So we've seen some of that. And while I'm not going to say that online vendors are terrible, I, I use Amazon all the time, but I don't buy my twisted pair cable from Amazon. All right, so only available from online vendors, and a lot of times it's, you look at their website and they have very poor English or very hard to understand English. So there's, there's locations uh, of, the, of the factory that are maybe hidden from you, or there's no mention of the lo factory location at all. Those are all things to be a little bit suspect of. If they don't want you to know where it's manufactured, I'm not sure why that would be. Then we've come to a situation where we have what I call counterfeit cable hiding in plain sight. And that is 
any copper communication cable that's made with copper clad aluminum. So you remember at the beginning of the presentation I said article 800.179 says you must have copper conductors. Well copper clad aluminum doesn't count for a copper conductor. It's not allowed for communication cable by the National Electrical Code and in fact no listing agency would give it a communication plenum or communication riser listing if it has copper clad aluminum conductors. So you can immediately assume that anything that says it's plenum rated or CMP that has got copper clad aluminum is a counterfeit product. Now there's many sites that are offering this cable for sale and in fact we've run across them unfortunately. We've got examples of that at the CCCA booth on the exhibit floor as well. So there are some real encounters and I want to jump to the video, uh, a short video that I'm going to talk through on a, an actual case study of a New York City contractor that encountered this. So this is a contractor that uh, encountered what I would call a fairly common and uh, unfortunate situation in our industry today. Uh, it was a fairly large contractor in New York City. Uh, Mark, the contractor, was told he had the job, but the customer said, we've already bought the cable and we're going to supply it for you. So Mark said, okay. When they showed up on the job site, he assumed that they had bought it from a reputable manufacturer. In fact, there was a spec. The crew, they arrived to do the, the work. The cable the customer was supplying was not the brand that had been specified. It was something else and was not the brand that they were supposed to get up a warranty on. So they looked at the box and they'd never heard of the brand before and they started to do some investigations. Couldn't find any specifications or verification of a UL listing and found that the product was actually conducted or con con constructed of uh, copper clad aluminum. That's actually banned not only in New York City but in other areas as well by the National Electrical Code. So he told his customer, I can't install this. It doesn't meet code and you would not get a warranty on this. Uh, the cable rep that was dealing with Mark looked around and found some other information from the CCCA as well as a couple of other websites and found that that particular manufacturer was actually called out by UL for using unauthorized listing marks. So the executives at this company said, well, we, you're not going to be able to use that product. They bought it and they couldn't use it and they couldn't sell it. So they were basically out about $30,000 in cost. So they ended up installing the originally specified product on this project and everything went well. They issued the warranty to the customer and afterwards Mark said, I have some words of wisdom or really words of warning to other people. Do not accept substitutes unless you're 100 percent certain that they are legitimate with a UL listing. And he personally never lets his customers buy the material anymore unless he's absolutely certain what that product is. So that's one big issue that we've seen in the marketplace and it's still happening today. We've done some additional surveillance programs in the market uh, other than the copper clad aluminum. We've started looking at the plenum rated products and this started several years ago in the first round of testing. We purchased the product on the open market. We purchased it, purchased it from distributors, uh, from online vendors. We took the products and there were uh, eight to ten samples of this, different manufacturers, and we submitted them to one of the testing laboratories and had them submit it to the NFPA 262 Steiner Tunnel Test, which measures flame spread and smoke generation. That first round of testing revealed some alarming things, one of which is that flame spread which is measured in feet here. So the, the Steiner Tunnel is a tunnel that's it's horizontally oriented and it, it's about 20 some feet long and there's a limit to how far a fire can spread. When you start a fire at one end of that tunnel, it can only spread about five feet, not about five, it can only spread less than five feet with that fire continuously generating flame at that one end. And then it has to stop, it has to self extinguish. And what we found was these counterfeit products burned well down the tunnel. They were, they were uh, generating flame and self-propagating down, down the length of the tunnel uh, over 15 feet. More importantly, there was smoke generation that was really significant, 500 percent above the limit. And smoke generation tends to be one of the worst parts of a fire because that is what 
can spread further than the flames and can jeopardize life safety even more than the flame itself. We did some additional testing and I'm going to set another video up for you so you can see visually what that testing looked like in the latest round. Four pair twisted pair communications cables snake through buildings you work or live in every day. They run between floors and from room to room. There are performance standards and more importantly safety codes that regulate the manufacture of these cables. It's in everyone's best interest that if a fire breaks out in a building, these communications cables don't act like a fuse and carry fire all over the building. The sad truth is, there are cable manufacturers that are manufacturing communications cable that does not pass fire in life safety building codes. However, they are labeling this cable with all the markings you might expect to find on properly constructed cables. This is a Steiner tunnel at an underwriter's laboratory's facility. This tunnel allows for control fire tests of communications cables. In the first test, a Category 5E control cable that is known to be properly constructed is loaded into the tunnel. Fire is applied to one end of the cable and technicians measure how far the fire travels down the cable. With this control cable, the fire travels one and a half feet within two and a half minutes then it doesn't travel any further down the cable even though the fire continues hitting the end of the cable for 20 minutes. The smoke from this burn only reaches an optical density of 0.22 and there is less smoke as time goes on. Both the fire and smoke tests are well within the National Fire Protection Association requirements. Now let's look at a counterfeit Category 5E cable that claims to be compliant with all safety codes. This cable was easily purchased on the open market. However, it is missing the required UL holographic label. The fire is started on one end of the cable and begins moving rapidly. In less than six minutes, the fire has spread down the full length of the tunnel. So the test is stopped. The counterfeit cable has failed spectacularly. In less than one minute, the optical density of the smoke is off the charts. When the test is finished, there is little to nothing left of the counterfeit non-compliant cable. Much of it has burnt completely to ash. The same company sells a Category 6 cable. The Steiner Tunnel test results were nearly identical, with the flame propagating the full length of the tunnel and lots of smoke filling the tunnel. So the difference between properly manufactured cables that have been UL tested and certified versus counterfeit cables utilizing non-compliant cable designs and materials is clear. Installing this counterfeit cable potentially opens up building owners and contractors to liability issues as it can lead to unacceptable levels of fire propagation through a building over the communications cabling system. Make sure you are buying reliable communications cable and not a fuse. Go to the CCCA's website to find out how you can be sure you are buying compliant cables. So that's a pretty disturbing view of how far and how fast that communication cable burns down the length of the tunnel. It wasn't self-extinguishing material at all that was used in those products and they claimed to be plenum rated. There is significant and disturbing liability for the installation of this type of product, unfortunately. Installers actually have a legal responsibility, something called a duty of care, to ensure that the products they install are compliant with the codes. The duty of care, as defined by Wikipedia here, is a legal obligation which is imposed on an individual requiring adherence to a standard of reasonable care while performing any acts that could foreseeably harm others. So the installation of electrical or communication cable is one of those areas. And liability exists whether or not the installer actually knows or verifies that the product is non-compliant. So it is very important that we know whether that product is compliant or not. The consequences for the installation of non-compliant products can be fairly significant. Building code violations, certainly. 
These building code violations vary by state, but can include fines, imprisonment. Uh, some states actually will impose fines every day that a non-compliance exists. So as long as that product is still installed, until it's removed, the fines are imposed every single day. You can also delay the granting of the certificate of occupancy. And in many cases, the trade that's responsible for that delay is subject to a fine. There's also possible civil liability for the installation of non-compliant product. Negligence could be one of those penalties. Liability for additional damages caused by the fire if it spreads because of communication cable. You could be accused of fraud with the possibility of additional jam damages, including punitive damages. And you could also be accused of breach of contract and warranty. So there's some consequences for the installation of some of this product. The CCCA is doing everything we can to help our industry avoid these kinds of issues. We are collaborating with Underwriters Laboratories and Intertech on quality assurance procedures. We're communicating and training and educating the industry in, in, op, in uh, venues like this. We're collaborating with and training global customs and law enforcement agencies. There have been seizures of product coming in to the US from outside of products that is either uh, counterfeit marked or known to be non-compliant. And we're ongo doing ongoing surveillance and testing as we talked about today, that latest Steiner tunnel test that was shown on that video. We're also doing things like webcasts in association with industry organizations like cabling installation and maintenance. We did uh, a, a webcast some time ago about these types of problems avoiding liability from a legal perspective and then underwriters laboratories did a section on how they protect their marks and, and labels and what kinds of things to look for. We're also presenting at industry conferences outside the North America. For those of you familiar with the, the latest round of changes to the codes in Europe, it is a myriad of fire safety uh, listings and, and code compliance. They have, I don't even know how, 12 different ratings for their products now that you have to comply with, depending on what country you're in or what, what it's being installed in or what have you. And we've seen that these new markings that are required on cables in Europe are also starting to be counterfeited and used without actually having undergone the actual qualification testing. So what can you do to protect yourself, your company, and the public? Well, long-term due diligence, is one area that you should always be looking to see. Is there something going on in the industry? Should you be uh, concerned about things? Look at industry media and attend events like this so that you're being coming informed. Look at the UL and Intertech websites. Like I say, they do have those public notices that they put up on their website when they do detect unauthorized use of their marks. Come to the CCCA website. We are always looking at the market and where our Co cooperating with both those listing agencies and making, uh, appointing people to those agencies when we detect something. Use the Cable Check app that we have available for both Google and Apple uh, store. And then buying familiar brands or known brands that you know are high quality. Uh, if it's an unknown brand, there are ways to tell whether or not that product is legitimately listed, as I mentioned earlier. So what you should watch out for, very low price can be an indication that a product may not be compliant, especially if it's a plenum rated product or claims to be plenum rated. Uh, unknown brand names with no information on factory location or country of origin. There's a reason that they are hiding that from you, I think. Suspicious advertising language, or in some cases just poor English, uh, talking about their listing marks and what kinds of uh, qualifications they have. Packaging and or cable with no UL marks or ETL marks. One of the things that we saw some of the manufacturers do that were called out in early testing was that UL went and went public and said, this company is, now, is not authorized to use our marks. So that company just stopped putting any reference to UL or ETL. They still printed CMP on their cable jacket, but they didn't list any listing agency. That's a counterfeit cable. 
More disturbing is some, some news that I heard from, from uh, someone recently in Canada that was saying that th there are manufacturers bringing cable into the country with no markings on it at all, and they'll print whatever you want on the cable legend when you get it here. That's, uh, that's a problem because that product's never been tested, most likely. Packaging, or, or excuse me, the copper clad aluminum is another thing to watch out for. That is not allowed by the National Electrical Code and would not receive a legitimate listing at all. What you should look for, reputable manufacturers and factory locations that you can identify readily, reputable vendors, industry consistent cost, listing marks from UL or Intertech and listing information on their website and quality packaging with smooth payout. So with that, I'm gonna conclude my presentation for the day and I thank you for listening. I can probably take a few questions before I go if anyone's interested in. Ooh. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so two questions. Um, first, you didn't really talk about whether any of these cables were tested for transmission performance and whether they passed or not. Yes, uh, on the first rounds of testing, we did do testing on transmission performance before uh, or in other samples of the same product. Some of them did pass, uh, like for Category 6 or Category 5E. Some of them did not. Uh, the other question is, in the industry that uh, we work in, oftentimes my customers will buy the cable themselves. Um, and we may be only called upon to do termination and testing. Mm -hmm. uh, so what liability would attach to us if the cable passed, but turns out later, in an, it turns up in an incident later? So did you pull the cable in or did you just come no, in and do the termination? Just term and testing or sometimes just testing. So the, my, my recommendation would be look at the cable, identify the manufacturer, and if you can, pull up their listing information. But it's really the responsibility of the party that purchases it and installs it that would, the liability would really let rest with for the most part. All right, thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. My question is similar. Um, often I've been on jobs where the customer provides the material. Most of the time the violation is not of a non-code. It's usually been in my experience where they deliver riser where plenum is required. And I've often thought that, well, I warned them uh, and then because they purchased it and hired me that the responsibility is on them. Are you implying that even after a warning that this is in violation of the code and they bought it, that I'm still liable as the installer? If you're actually pulling the cable, yes, you're, it, you're, yes it would be your liability because you, you have clearly identified that it is a product that's installed in an environment for which it is not listed. And I would be surprised if you could get away with that with a code inspector later coming in and looking at it. But I would definitely tell the customer that it would be a code violation to put a riser rated cable in a plenum environment. Most of the time these are buildings that are already got a C of A and it's an upgrade mm -hmm. and very often it's a very, very large vendor, you know, somebody, a department store that I'm sure everyone here would know mm -hmm. or a restaurant and, and that I'm thinking about right now. Yep. Um, I apologize for that. Um, yeah, but I just, this is the first time that I fully understood. I always thought that once you point out that it's in violation and they purchased it, that the onus is on them, but you're saying I'm still liable, so. Yes, if you go ahead and do the installation uh, with a, in, and knowingly put it into an environment for which it was not listed, then you could still be held liable. Okay, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Christian Oricari from Finisar. Uh, thank you. Very nice presentation. Um, you cover copper cables um, only, um, but uh, UL also um, certifies uh, fiber optic cabling and as well as active transceiver infrastructure, um, particularly for laser eye safety, also for electrical compliance of active components. We know there is counterfeit product out there as well for those kind of devices. Have you done any testing or any kind of uh, work in addition to what you presented on the um, fiber optic side? Uh, 
Yes, we've done some uh, surveillance on fiber optic cable as well. For the most part, I would say we haven't encountered as much flame rating problems with, with uh, optical fiber cable as we have with copper cable. Um, fiber optic cable tends to be able to use different materials than copper cable because they're not, they're not concerned with uh, the electrical properties, right? And, and so uh, we're not seeing that as much of a problem. But we do have some information on our website on some of the things we're finding with optical fiber uh, products. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, also thank you for your comments. I know it isn't exactly your organization's scope, but I wonder if you are familiar with uh, holographic labeling. Would that apply also to devices like patch panels or uh, things of that sort, routers? Uh, today, my, my, to my knowledge, they're not requiring the use of a holographic label for things like patch panels and those types of things, even if they're getting the UL listing. Um, it's impractical in some cases to be able to apply a label to something as small as a jack, right? And if you purchase a jack individually or those kinds of things. So uh, my recommendation, though, would be to go to the UL website and uh, look a little bit deeper into that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much.